Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to you all. I hope that you stay well. We continue to struggle to cope with the surge of the uh, Omicron variant. And I hope that we can get through this swiftly and uh, resume our activities uh, quick as soon as possible. Uh, today, I'm very pleased to welcome you all and thank you for attending the Japan-Norway Sustainable Ocean Policy Forum 2022. We are co-organizing this forum for today and tomorrow together with the Embassy of the Royal Kingdom of Norway in Japan. The forum is to undertake policy dialogues on ocean management and marine spatial planning for today and sustainable fisheries and international partnership for tomorrow. I would like to thank Ambassador Inga Nihamao of the Kingdom of Norway to Japan and her staff members for supporting the organization of this forum. At this forum, we have an honor to have our prominent speakers from the government of Japan, government of Norway and experts and practitioners of both countries. I also thank all the speakers who have agreed to address at this forum and share with us their expertise and perspectives for a sustainable ocean. Japan and Norway play a very important role in promoting a sustainable ocean nationally and internationally. Norway advances sustainable fisheries aquaculture and offshore energy and are and are important components for blue economies. Norway has taken an initiative to strengthen international cooperation for achieving a sustainable ocean and promote blue economies. Norway established a high-level panel for sustainable ocean economy or so-called the Ocean Panel in 2018 with 14 heads of states and governments and UN Special Envoy for the Ocean. Prime Minister Jonas Gar Stolore of Norway and President uh, Srangel Wips Jr. of Palau co-chair the panel. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida of Japan is a member of the panel. The Ocean Policy Research Institute of the Sasaka Peace Foundation is a member of the advisory network for the Ocean Panel and Dr. Hide Sakaguchi, the president of the Ocean Policy Research Institute, is a member of the expert group for the Ocean Panel from Japan. We have uh, had a privilege to host the international webinar to launch the policy recommendation of the Ocean Panel in December 2020. One of the key policy recommendations made by the Ocean Panel is to develop a sustainable ocean plan and manage 100% of the ocean sustainability, su sustainability by 2025. 14 member countries of the Ocean Panel, uh, including Japan and Norway, have uh, committed to promoting the development and implementation of a sustainable ocean plan and sustainably manage 100% of the ocean sustainability. Japan has adopted the Basic Act of Ocean Policy in 2007 and have renewed the Basic Plan on Ocean Policy three times, and we need to ensure that the measures are promoted in line with the Basic Act and Basic Plan to achieve the ocean uh, policy goal of sustainably managing 100% of the ocean. The Ocean Panel also called for other coastal and ocean states to follow that suit and manage 100% of the ocean sustainably by 2030. There are countries that have not yet adopted the national policy for a sustainable ocean. Ocean Policy Research Institute is working closely with its partners, governments, and organizations in exploring ways to assist the governments, institutes, and stakeholders groups 
aims pursuing the development and implementation of sustainable ocean plans. Such plans also provide an important basis for sustainable fisheries, and that uh, we, are, we will address tomorrow. The year 2022 is said to be another super year for the ocean. Last week, uh, President uh, Emmanuel Macron of France convened the ocean, uh, One Ocean Summit in Brest, France, and uh, Dr. Hide Sakaguchi traveled to attend the meeting in Brest. OPRI has been working closely with the government of Palau in, in preparing for the o Our Ocean Conference to be held in Palau this April. The government of Portugal and the government of Kenya will co-host the second UN Ocean Conference this June. The discussions we are having at this forum for the next two days will enrich our knowledge and strengthen our partnerships to contribute such an international process for achieving the sustainable ocean. Japan and Norway promote collaboration on ocean issues. There will be a Japan Norway ocean event in Enoshima this April and uh, starts at uh, Lake Rukrum. Lemkrum, uh, the Norway's largest and oldest sailing ship, will come to Yokohama this summer. I am sure that uh, Japan and no Norway will continue to promote collaboration towards achieving a sustainable ocean. To achieve a sustainable ocean, we need a across the sectoral and multi-stakeholder collaboration from interdisciplinary perspective. Ocean Policy Research Institute intends to serve as a knowledge hub, innovation catalyst, and partnership facilitator by strengthening collaboration and networks with you all. Once again, I thank you for your support and participation at this forum. I look forward to productive discussions and future collaboration. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Tsushi Tsunami, uh, President of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation, for making a welcome remarks with the background of his hometown, um, Okayama Prefecture, uh, that is well known for uh, fisheries, aquaculture, and agriculture as well. Um, my name is Masanori Kobayashi, uh, Senior Research Fellow of the Ocean Policy Research Institute of the Sasakawa Peace Foundations. I'm very pleased to moderate uh, today's important session um, called uh, Japan Norway Sustainable Ocean Policy Forum 2022. Um, today, uh, we have a specific thematic focus on sustainable ocean management and marine spatial planning. I wish we could have uh, met face-to-face uh, -face, uh, in Tokyo. Uh, nonetheless, uh, due to the uh, prolonged uh, COVID-19, uh, we have decided to convene this in a virtual forum. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, put this um, uh, meeting uh, in the proper context um, by sharing um, some of the introductory uh, remarks in connections with the um, Sustainable Ocean Plan. Um, of course, Japan and Norway are well known for the uh, ocean state. And uh, uh, in terms of our work, um, as Dr. Tsunami mentioned, that OPRI has been acting as a member of the advisory network for the high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy that the Norwegian government has established in the year 2018. We had the privilege of convening an international online symposium uh, to launch uh, policy recommendations uh, of the high level panel or ocean panel. Um, panel itself consists of a very prominent uh, leaders around the world. Uh, Prime Minister Humio Kishida of Japan uh, is a member um, and uh, uh, President uh, of the uh, Republic of Parao, uh, President Whips, and also 
uh, Prime Minister uh, of uh, Norway uh, uh, is also uh, co-chairing uh, this meeting. Uh, we had uh, met uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, Store uh, in Glasgow, uh, the COP26, uh, last November, and uh, he demonstrated his leadership uh, in convening a high-level policy, policy forum for the high-level panel. Uh, Ocean itself um, has uh, uh, multiple stakeholders and the users, and for this uh, proper consensus building on the use and the rules for the ocean use is uh, very important. Uh, when we look at uh, international uh, partners, for instance, uh, Palau has designated the ocean area as uh, 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 marine protected areas, almost 80% and 20% is allocated for fishing zones. Um, Japan itself um, has adopted the uh, basic act on uh, ocean policy in the year 2007, uh, followed by the adoption of the first basic plan on ocean policy in 2008. Thereafter, every five years, the Japanese government has been revising this five-year uh, ocean uh, plan. Uh, ocean plan itself, uh, its implementation is spearheaded by the headquarters for ocean policy of Japan, headed by the prime minister of Japan, and the line ministries have been cooperating uh, as well as other <coughs> stakeholders. Uh, 2018, uh, the third uh, basic plan on ocean policy has uh, a different uh, um, thematic uh, focus, such as uh, marine information collections, information gathering, collaboration and the corporations. And uh, uh, one of the key topic for the marine uh, domain awareness, um, for instance, uh, the um, uh, Coast Guard of Japan has launched a website to share the maritime information, including the uh, marine environment and the marine conditions, biophysical conditions of the uh, ocean uh, areas. Uh, this uh, marine spatial planning is particularly important uh, in the sense that uh, many countries are expected to expand the marine protected areas. Japan adopted the new areas as a marine protected areas in 2020, and the coverage of MPA has increased from 8.23 to 13.3 uh, in the year 2021. Uh, representative of the Environment Ministry of Japan uh, will ever elaborate uh, on this aspect. Um, we will also have a discussion on the marine spatial planning for offshore wind power generations. Uh, representative of the private sector uh, will highlight some of the key issues for uh, promoting a consensus building and the benefits sharing uh, from the optimal use of uh, ocean space. Uh, for the uh, offshore power generations. So marine spatial planning is uh, particularly important in the context of the uh, promotion of the blue economies. Uh, Multi-stakeholder engagement is uh, particularly essential in terms of the uh, government, uh, local government, national government, private sector, research institute and the businesses to work together and obviously the finance is a critical component for the effective implementation of marine spatial planning and enabling policies such as legislations are also vital. Uh, information exchange and uh, knowledge sharing uh, are also important and the institutions like ours uh, are also expected to play an important role in uh, collecting and disseminating evidence-based information for effective uh, development and implementations of marine uh, spatial planning in the context of achieving a sustainable ocean um, around the world. 
So this is a, a basic um, background and the context of convening uh, this Japan-Norway Ocean Forum uh, with an emphasis today on the marine spatial planning. And I have a, a particular pleasure now to introduce to Mr. Pa Wilhelm Schieb, uh, director of the Norwegian Ministry of Climate and Environment, who will share with us about uh, Norwegian's efforts to promote uh, sustainable ocean and marine spatial planning. So may I now invite uh, Mr. Pierre Wilhelm Schiel to take a floor. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Very good. Uh, so good afternoon and good morning to everybody. Uh, it's uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And, and certainly Japan and Norway are two ocean nations. And uh, next time maybe we'll meet in Tokyo to further the discussions, but let's take this as a very nice start. Uh, as pointed out in the introduction, both Japan and Norway are members of the ocean panel, and we have to develop and present a sustainable ocean plan by 2025. Could I have my slides, please? Uh, yes, um, my colleague is uh, putting up uh, your slide. Just very one good. second. So we can have the next slide then. Thank you. Uh, as you recall, in December 2020, uh, the Ocean Panel presented their conclusions called Transformations for a Sustainable Ocean Economy. Here I have pointed out some kind of conceptual framework for, for what this transformation imply. It implies to move from a fragmented uh, management approach to a holistic and integrated management. It implies that you move from a sector-based approach to a cross-sectoral. You move from a single species to ecosystem approach. And you uh, move from the impacts of single pressures to cumulative impacts. So, in a way, you have the marine ecosystem in the center of all the activities, and you have to consider the interconnections in a holistic way. So, next slide. Like Japan, we do not start from scratch in developing our sustainable ocean plan. In Norway, we have since 2002 developed a system for what we call integrated ocean management plans. These plans will be the basis for the development of our sustainable ocean plan. The management plans are developed and presented as white papers by the government and then adopted by the Norwegian parliament, the Storting. This means that the plans are anchored at the highest political level in Norway. I will quickly present uh, some of the highlights within the system we have established to develop these plans. So next slide. The integrated ocean management plans have two objectives. Uh, they promote value creation through sustainable use of marine resources and ecosystem services. And at the same time, they contribute to maintain ecosystem structure, functioning, productivity, and biodiversity. In this way, the management plans clarify the overall framework, closer co coordination and clear priorities in the Norwegian ocean management. They also increase the predictability and facilitate coexistence between ocean industries and activities. So next slide. 
As we saw from uh, Japan, we also had developed an ex extensive structure for the development of these plans. The plans are based on a factual basis, which includes the state of the marine environment and ecosystems. We then undertake an assessment of impacts of the marine environment, as well as value creation of ocean industries and human activities. We uh, do an assessment of cumulative impacts and together with this factual basis, the subsequently policy and political decisions are developed and presented in the management plan. Throughout the process, there is involvement of stakeholders, both from marine industries, environmental NGOs and the public at large. So next slide. Uh, this is an example of the output of the plants, uh, and it's shown from, uh, from the plants of the Barents Sea. The cornerstone of the plan is the identification of the so-called valuable and vulnerable areas. In the Barents Sea, you see this at the, at the picture to the left side. These are the most valuable uh, areas when it comes to ecosystem functioning and where you found the most ecological values. This uh, identification of the um, valuable and vulnerable areas has led to the management and political designation of areas where they will not take place offshore oil and gas activities, which are the blue areas in the map on the right side. This demonstrates the spa spatial concept of the management plans. So next slide. Now we're moving uh, to develop the SOP. And, I, and as I said, the management plans will be the foundation and point of departure for development of the Norwegian Sustainable Ocean Plan. As said by the panel, uh, the Sustainable Ocean Plan will guide the transition to a sustainable ocean economy. There are many items and challenges to cover, and some of them will be the ongoing decarbonization of ocean transport, what we call uh, green shipping, the promotion of sustainable fisheries and aquaculture that you will do address in the seminar tomorrow, and then we will have the new ocean industries that are in the beginning of their development, such as offshore aquaculture, deep sea mining, and renewable energy industries, in particular floating offshore wind. The sustainable ocean plans provide the basis to secure that these new industries will be sustainable. So next slide. Finally, uh, other challenges to address in the Sustainable Ocean Plan will be uh, such as the impacts of climate change to ocean ecosystems, the challenges to manage management represented by higher ocean temperature and heat waves, sea level rise and ocean acidification. We also should cover the ocean as a solution to climate change, which have be, been highlighted in a, a special uh, report uh, by the Ocean Panel. We will have to address the competition for ocean space through tools such as marine spatial planning, which we will discuss today. We certainly will have to fight marine pollution, in particular plastic pollution. Hopefully it will be agreed will be agreed in two weeks' time to start the formal negotiations of a new global plastic treaty. And there will be the development of new management tools, such as ocean accounting, which also has been highlighted as a transformation by the ocean panel. In other words, both Japan and Norway have a job to do in the coming years on developing a sustainable ocean plan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Pierre Wilhelm Schieb, uh, for highlighting uh, uh, key elements of Norwegian's uh, policy for sustainable ocean 
Um, I think uh, you underline these linkages uh, between ocean and the climate, and obviously uh, we have to handle these increasing competitions for the ocean uh, space, as well as uh, plastic and um, other management uh, issues as well. Um, the, due to the parliament sessions, uh, our colleague uh, representative of the uh, ocean headquarters of Japanese cabinet office was unable to join us, but uh, I hope that uh, next time we can have a more broader uh, dialogues uh, between uh, Norwegian representative and the Japanese government representative as well. Uh, we will get back to you about additional questions, but let me uh, just move on to the next speaker to introduce uh, Mr. Toshihiro Kitamura, uh, Deputy Director General of the International Cooperation Bureau, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan. Um, he is also working and involved in the work uh, for the ocean panel. And uh, I'm very pleased that uh, he could uh, join us today to share the perspectives as to how the Japanese government uh, is trying to work on these uh, ocean issues as uh, global challenges. Mr. Kitamura, uh, please uh, take a floor. Yes, thank you, Mr. Kobayashi. And uh, uh, good morning and good evening, everyone. I'm very honored to participate in this webinar today. Uh, as uh, uh, Norway and Japan are both maritime nations, as pointed out by my previous speakers, and have developed by, uh, by benefiting from uh, the sea in many ways. So Japan and Norway uh, are connected by sea uh, and can be considered neighbors, even neighbors, uh, uh, across the Arctic Ocean. So uh, Japan and Norway uh, have been cooperating through networks, such a uh, framework such as a uh, uh, high-level ocean panel, high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy, and uh, uh, so uh, the Arctic Council. I think uh, the headquarters of this Arctic Council is located in Norway. Uh, it is so worthwhile to, for these two countries to hold this kind of uh, webinar uh, to discuss sustainable ocean policies. Uh, uh, let me touch upon my personal things. Uh, I first visited Norway in, in the summer of 2000, uh, no, 1994. I was living in France then, and uh, short af shortly after uh, my marriage, I, my, my, my wife and I visited Oslo and Spitsbergen Island in the Svalbard archipelago, which were shown in the slide of Mr. Shibe, in my, of my previous speaker. I don't think uh, that uh, there are many couples in the world who, visit, who have visited Spitsbergen Island for their honeymoon. And by the way, uh, for Japanese audience, uh, is probably familiar with the music band uh, Spitz. Uh, the official fan club is called Spitzbergen as well. Just for your information, I am getting off uh, the track and I'd like to return to my presentation. So please see uh, page two of the slide. Uh, the issue of oceans, uh, which occupy 70.8% of the surface of the planet, is very important. Japan, with its small uh, land areas and lack of natural resources, have achieved its economic development uh, uh, through maritime trade and the uh, utilization of maritime resources. So it is important uh, for Japan to maintain and develop a free, open, and stable ocean. The government of Japan uh, has been working to ensure the safety of maritime tra traffic and uh, cooperation uh, in maritime security. In particular, uh, recently, Japanese government is promoting efforts to realize so-called free and open in the Pacific in order to bring safety and prosperity for the Indo-Pacific region by strengthening maritime orders, uh, order in the region where important sea lanes are located. In this context, uh, Japan, government of Japan seriously uh, uh, takes the fact that the oceans have been uh, severely affected by recent global environment problems such as uh, uh, marine, marine pollution and the climate change. I think human beings 
benefits from the ocean in various ways, including food, uh, resources, uh, energy, employment, and industry. And they are, they are closely linked to our lives. So addressing these environment crises and coexisting the ocean in the sustainable manner is essential uh, for us to survive uh, to survive in on this planet. So uh, today I'd like to uh, touch upon the role of diplomacy in this uh, field. So please see the page three of the slide. I have listed uh, three roles of diplomacies as examples. First, uh, building global momentum. The second, international rulemaking. And third is uh, international cooperation on the next page. So first, global, uh, building global momentum. At the G7 summit held in Cornwall, uh, UK, and the G20 summit in Rome, Italy, uh, held uh, last year, both held uh, last year. Uh, the world le leaders uh, discussed uh, various same, uh, issues for, for related climate and environmental issues, and the issues the leaders communicate and uh, document in this regard. The documents include issues such as uh, the protection of biodiversity uh, and measures to combat marine plastic uh, pollution and state the leader's uh, determination uh, to tackle these uh, issues and call on the intended community as well to strengthen its uh, efforts. So uh, while building this global momentum, it is also the role of diplomacy to conduct international rulemaking in order to promote uh, concrete measures. Uh, and Japan has been actively uh, participating in this process. For example, with regard to biodiversity, uh, the second part of the 15th conference of the parties to the Convention on Biodiversity, so-called COP15, will be held in Kunming, China, uh, this year. And the post-2020 international framework for biodiversity will be formulated by revising the existing H targets, which was established at COP10, uh, held in 2010 in Nagoya, H prefecture. So as for uh, the issues of marine plastic litter, uh, the United Nations uh, Environment Assembly, so-called UNAIR 5.2, will be held in Kenya from the end of this month, and my colleague uh, will participate in that the conference as well. And there will be the discussion to launch the negotiation for a new international legally binding instrument. The so Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan, in cooperation with Ministry of uh, Environment as a relevant ministry, is also actively participating in its preparation process uh, uh, now. So next slide, please. The third role of diplomacy is international cooperation, specifically in knowledge sharing and mutual uh, cooperation among countries to support and support for the developing countries also very important. Uh, Japan has been uh, pro uh, providing various kinds of uh, assistance to the developing countries through our ODA, Official Development Assistance, and has been actively sharing our knowledge to the developing countries on the issues of marine plastic litter. So at the G20 Osaka summit, which was held in 2019, Japan set out Osaka Blue Ocean Vision, uh, which uh, aims to reduce additional pollution by marine plastic litter to zero uh, by 2050. And the currently 87 uh, countries and the regions are participating in this initiative. And in order to realize this vision, Japan is promoting uh, the Marine Initiative. Marine is uh, an acronym for uh, management of waste, recovery of marine litter, innovation, and empowerment. 
So、uh, through this initiative,、uh, Japan is providing uh, uh, that's our support to in the field of the capacity building and the,、uh, to the developing、uh, countries. The, finally,、uh, I'd like to take up a high level panel for sustainable ocean economy, which is also called as ocean panel, as repeatedly explained. By my previous speaker,、uh, the ocean panel is a framework initiated by Norway. And I believe that its strength lies not only in the、uh, participation of the world leaders, but also in the support of a group of experts and, and a network of stakeholders and、uh, stakeholders from business,、uh, NGOs, and civil society. So, in this regard, I highly appreciate the、uh, contribution、uh, made by Satsagawa Peace Foundation in Japan. And Japanese Prime Minister、uh, has been participant、uh, since its inception. And the, at the meeting、uh, held at the margin of the COP26 in Glasgow, UK last、uh, November, Prime Minister、uh, Kishida expressed his de determination to tackle、uh, climate change. And marine、uh, plastic pollution and contribute, he's also de、uh, expressed his determination to contribute to the building a sustainable ocean economy. So,、uh, as mentioned in the opening remarks by the president, the tsunami、uh, from February 9 to 11, the One Ocean Summit was held in Brest in France, where Prime Minister The、Kishida also sent a video message to convey Japan's uh, efforts, uh, as I explained to, today. And、uh, at the One Ocean Summit,、uh, French President Macron,、uh, the host of the summit,、uh, also、uh, president of the,、uh, he is holding the presidency of the European Union、uh, during the, the, the first half of this year. Announced his intention to participate in the ocean panel. So now 16 leaders are participating in this ocean panel. So、oh, this comes to the end of my、uh, presentation.、Uh, so before, be, before leaving, please、uh, show, show everyone the next slide.、Uh, so this is what I explained. And the、uh, next slide, please, as well. So This is uh, uh, the, con、uh, the message sent by、uh, our Prime Minister Kishida to the One Ocean Summit, which was held in France. Sorry for mentioning this slide. So, so this comes to the end of my presentation. I apologize for、uh, the last、uh, story. And、uh, I have explained Japan's efforts to, to, for a sustainable ocean from a diplomatic perspective. And international cooperation and collaboration、uh, are essential for the future、uh, coexistence of, of,、uh, of humans with the ocean. So,、uh, once again, I commend highly the Norway's leadership、uh, in this field and including the launch of this uh, uh, ocean panel. And Japan will also continue to play an active role、uh, in, the, in this regard in cooperation with other countries of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kitamura, for highlighting the Japanese government、uh, diplomacy for promoting a global momentum, rule making, and international corporations. And I'm also very pleased that、uh, Prime Minister Kishida's、uh, message was delivered in Brest. And、uh, our OPRI president, Hide Sakaguchi, is actually coming back from Brest today. And、uh, he may be able to share with us his perspectives、uh, on the outcome of the Brest summit,、uh, maybe at the session tomorrow.、Uh, now、um, I have a pleasure、uh, to introduce the next speaker.、Um, um, Mr.、Uh, Yohei Mori, examiner, Bio Biodiversity Policy Division,、uh, Nature Conservation Bureau, Ministry of the Environment, Japan.、Um, as I briefly mentioned, this marine spatial planning is particularly important uh, to uh, increase the coverage of MPS 
uh, uh, within Japan, um, and uh, I I understand that Mr. Mori will share with us the experience of Japanese Environment Ministry in applying this marine spatial planning in the context of uh, marine environment conservations. So, Mr. Mori, uh, may I invite you to take a floor. Yes, thank you very much. And allow me to speak in Japanese. I am Mori, a Biodiversity Policy Division, a Ministry of the Environment. And I'd like to share with you our experiences in biodiversity conservation based upon the marine spatial planning to achieve the goals that are identified in Aichi. Uh, goals. I'd like to start sharing the screen. This is the title of my presentation, Area-Based Marine Biodiversity Conservation in Japan. First, I'd like to touch on the framework of the biodiversity conservation framework in Japan. There is national biodiversity strategy that was adopted by the government for conservation of biodiversity. Uh, this is related to the uh, entry of effect of, of biodiversity, or rather Convention on Biological Diversity. And followed, following that uh, the adoption or the uh, following the entry of the convention into effect in 1995, the first biodiversity national strategy was formulated. And then in 2008, the Biodiversity Basic Act was adopted. And in 2010, as a legal framework, the, the fourth national biodiversity strategy was adopted, uh, which is uh, defined as a statutory strategy back to uh, the, the first through third strategy they were not uh, defined as a statutory strategy about following the enactment of the basic act they, it became the statutory strategy and then in 2010 when the cop met in aichi in japan the aichi biodiversity targets were adopted and following that the, as you may know CBD COP15 is yet to be organized and has been postponed and therefore in expecting the discussion that will take place at COP15, we are currently working on the formulation, the, the next national strategy. And now following the uh, fifth strategy, we have been undertaking various initiatives for conservation of marine biodiversity after IET target was set in 2010. Back then, 10% MPAs were adopted uh, as a target to be achieved through to 2020. And then in 2011, based upon the fourth national biodiversity strategy, the strategy that solely focusing on marine environment was formulated. It was not statutory framework, but rather the Ministry of Environment was engaged in discussion with experts to come up with the marine conservation strategy. And then from 2011, first, based upon EBSAs of the Japanese version, we started investigation. And from 2011 up to around 2013, investigation was performed. The results were announced in 2016. And then based upon the EBSA's selection, the biodiversity conservation and management uh, should be performed. And that is why uh, the Nature Conservation Law was amended in 2019 to establish the new system that is about the revised offshore natural environment conservation zone. 
And then according to that, various areas were designated as such. And I'd like to discuss with you today uh, the flow of uh, the establishment of offshore seabed natural environment conservation area, as well as area-based conservation in initiatives to achieve the IT target 11. I mentioned earlier about biodiversity national strategy and uh, the special strategy that solely focuses on maritime environment. And the goals were identified according to the biodiversity national strategy and the third, uh, the basic uh, plan on marine environment, where the national targets were described according to IT target. And the aim here is to uh, achieve conservation of 10% of the areas within EEZ. And thus, uh, the Minister of Environment came up with the national strategy to achieve the target for conservation of the biodiversity and uh, the sustainable utilization of ecosystem services. The concepts behind that are described. And then also the existing systems as well as the background or specified together with the definition of MPAs. That is a clearly defined geographical space managed in accordance with the, its usage patterns through legal or other effective means to achieve the conservation of biodiversity that supports a healthy structure and functioning of marine ecosystem as well as the sustainable use of ecosystem services. That's the definition given for MPAs in Japan. And now according to that, the MPAs are defined and established in Japan. And when strategy was um, adopted, I mentioned earlier that EBSAs were selected. And at the time the strategy was formulated, uh, the area-wise, it covered only 8.3%. But to achieve IG target, we have to expand uh, the area coverage of MPAs. Therefore, we selected EVSAs. At first, we need to consider the areas of high demand from the point of view of conservation of biodiversity, and then consider where to uh, locate them as MPAs. From 2011 to 2013, five experts established a study group for selection of EVSAs. And then EBSA uh, standard as well as the various uh, principles and the references for selection were defined and then based upon scientific data analysis and consultation with experts, selection was performed. And as a result of consideration from uh, the biodiversity point of view for <clears throat> areas of high demand, the coastal areas offshore surface area as well as offshore seabed areas were defined and 321 areas were selected and after consultation with various ministries and agencies concerned they were announced in april 2016. also we looked into the difference uh, or the, the the overlaps between japanese version of ebsas and the mpas and we found out that in coastal areas a little bit less than 70% have been already designated as MPAs, but is, as you move toward the offshore, the percentage of coverage was lower, and especially in the case of seabed, it turned out that it is scarcely protected or covered. Therefore, for offshore areas, especially seabed areas, that's where we saw the need for intensifying the efforts for conservation. Now, based upon such gap analysis, the seabed uh, resource exploitation, exploration, exploitation, 
among others, are performed, which could uh, disturb the ecosystem there, and that could produce irreversible impact and to ecosystem and marine resources there. Therefore, as a precautionary approach, based upon existing findings, we decided to select MPAs and then conduct conservation. From 2017, with experts, we started conservation of MPAs in offshore area. And based upon discussion there, the MPAs were actually identified and announced. And, and then in 2019, the Act for Nature Environment Conservation was revised to achieve a compatible goals of the conservation of uh, deep seabed uh, or deep sea ecosystem and the maritime resources utilization. The new MPAs were established and within those areas that were identified this time, we decided to include uh, the some unique features such as the seamount, hydrothermal vents, as well as submarine trenches. And for such areas of importance, the some activities uh, cannot be performed without licensing. And for other areas, the plan for the utilization has to be submitted as application. And also in those areas at present, we introduce various restrictions, including the mining activities and towing of uh, gears that could change the topography of the seabed. And as I said earlier, in December 2020, four areas around Ogasawara were designated as new MPAs in the deep seabed in Japan. With that, the coverage of MPAs has been expanded from 8.3% to 13.3% toward the achievement of IT target 11. Uh, the, we believe we actually achieved the target of ours. Now the MPAs stretch around 586,000 square kilometers. And according to various purposes, we have uh, located uh, those areas as such, and those under jurisdiction of MP, uh, Ministry of Environment, that is 5.5%, and 8.1% falls into the, the jurisdiction of Ministry of, or rather, Fishery Agency. And now we are expecting discussion of 30 by 30 that could be discussed in the, the post Aichi framework and especially other effective area-based conservation measures or OECM and utilization of that uh, has been already subject to uh, discussion in Japan. This concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mori, for highlighting the process for designating uh, deep sea areas as uh, protected areas uh, in Japan. I think uh, this uh, approach is uh, very much uh, unique uh, in Japan, and uh, we are very much interested in how Japan will actually expand this protected areas at a different layer of the ocean as well. Um, this brings uh, us to the end of the uh, three speakers uh, who spoke at this uh, uh, keynote session. And um, you might have noticed that there's a box to send uh, uh, questions and comments through the APRI called slide. And uh, we certainly continue to welcome your feedback uh, from that slide. Uh, may I just um, ask uh, questions first to uh, Mr. Uh, Sheev and also Mr. Mori uh, regarding this um, um, consensus building among stakeholders on this uh, marine spatial planning. As Mr. Sheev mentioned, there's a competition for the ocean space and uh, it may be difficult to have a kind of agreement at, uh, among the stakeholders on this uh, conservation measures or the delineation of the ocean areas for particular use. Um, may I invite uh, Mr. Shiv, uh, what are the particular considerations you are underlining in building a consensus 
among uh, um, the different uh, stakeholders for the marine spatial planning in Norway. Well, well <clears throat> let me first say that uh, marine spatial planning is a kind of wide concept. So uh, we will uh, consider uh, our management plans as a um, spatial concept, but not according to, like, let's say, the EU Marine Spatial uh, Maritime Spatial Planning Directive, which is a more specific concept. So we are now in the starting blocks, in a way, to consider uh, a more uh, in-depth procedure of marine spatial planning because we now see the emerging of new ocean industries such as uh, offshore wind but uh, according to the the present uh, management plan regime uh, it uh, It is in, um, in particular, the, the fisheries and the uh, offshore oil and gas that is a kind of a competition for space. And uh, they have both been included in the process of the management plans. So in a way, they have been included in what are the factual basis, where are the important areas, uh, what are the values uh, con uh, associated with the activities? There you have a kind of difficult case for the fisheries because the offshore oil and gas produce so much uh, provenance. So, um, but 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 uh, the output uh, and and also certainly you have the valuable areas. But the valuable marine areas is also often valuable for, for the fisheries. So in a way, these blue areas that you saw on the map uh, was uh, the output when you had the kind of com competition for space between the offshore oil and gas and, and uh, the fisheries and uh, environmental uh, interests. What, how the map will look like in 2024 or 25 when you add on offshore wind in particular. It's a little bit early to say, <laughs> but that's that's the interesting uh, challenge that we have to face. Okay, yeah, please uh, keep your camera on and uh, thank you for mentioning this uh, uh, fossil fuel, uh, offshore energy, fishery, they are indeed uh, important industry that may uh, occasionally compete each other. Uh, let me uh, ask uh, Mr. Mori to share his experience as to how uh, the Environment Ministry tried to uh, forge this uh, consensus uh, or mutual understanding and agreement on this uh, uh, seabed uh, protected areas. Uh, Mori-san, onigashimasu. Hi. Thank you for the question. I am not directly engaged in designing the system. But as far as I hear discussion by the speakers, in fact, like in Norway, we try to focus on coordination consultation with stakeholders. And in NPA's definition in Japan, not only conservation biodiversity, but also sustainable use of the services provided by the uh, resources are also taken into account in establishing MPAs. And talking about sustainable use, uh, that's considered as a key. So we try to focus on that as well. That is, the, we should ensure sustainable use. through coordination consultation with other stakeholders and for future possible resource exploration 
Some of them are still in the developmental phase, and therefore, we also need to improve the depth of knowledge that we have, which could be used for redefining the MPAs, so including that. The conservation of ecosystem based upon existing knowledge and the sustainable utilization of services and resources based upon existing knowledge is what we are trying to achieve through consultation with other stakeholders. I may invite Mr. Kitamura to share uh, your perspectives as to what are the important meetings and the processes that are coming up uh, on the ocean issues for this year. Um, I understand that uh, Japan and Norway have to collaborate on this issue as well. Uh, may I elaborate a bit more on the significant and important processes that are coming up on ocean for this year? Thank you, Mr. Kobayashi. Yes, uh, as I mentioned during my presentation, uh, the UNEA 5.2 uh, will start uh, from uh, end of this month. So one of the main uh, uh, important area is uh, uh, the marine plastic litter. So uh, Japan will make further contribution to 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 global fight to the global fight for against this marine uh, plastic litter, and uh, we uh, uh, continue to provide our assistance based on the uh, Osaka Blue Ocean visions uh, as ha we have been extending uh, up to now. Uh, in the coming uh, this UN UNA 5.2. The, one of the uh, focus will be put on the discussion to start the possible legally binding instrument to, to on maritime uh, uh, marine uh, plastic litter. So we are now coordinating with relevant countries uh, in order to prepare a draft resolution to, to, to start this uh, international negotiations on marine plastic litter. So this is uh, uh, our priority for a short target. And um, as for other things, yes, we have many uh, international events this year, including uh, such a COP, uh, second round of COP15 uh, of uh, on biodiversity, uh, yes, we are, uh, we are continue to work with other uh, countries, including Norway, and uh, especially this uh, uh, this ocean panel, uh, high level panel, is a quite important uh, forum uh, to, to 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 accelerate our efforts uh, while coordinating our policies among us and uh, I, uh, by identifying the possible areas of cooperation uh, among the countries. So we shall uh, continue to work with Norway and the other members of this uh, uh, hybrid panel as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kitamura, uh, for uh, sharing your uh, insight on the forthcoming uh, processes, money plastic agreement. This is a, a, a kind of a, a testing case uh, for the international community uh, to make another yeah. agreement uh, on this. You issue. Love me for a yes, small Mr. Remark? Shira, please. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. And and I also would like to highlight the upcoming UNIA meeting. And you know, the Norwegian Minister of the Environment, uh, Climate and Environment, is the leader of UNIA. So I think we, we stand shoulder by shoulder with Japan on, on addressing this issue. So so let's cross our fingers for, for a fruitful outcome of UNIA. And I, I would also like to... to uh, Welcome very much to the present, uh, presentation by uh, Mr. Mori on, on uh, the new uh, MPAs, deep sea uh, water uh, MPAs. That, that was really interesting. And I think we, we play by the same rules. We identify the EBSAs, but, but we use them maybe in a little different way. We have used them to identify the uh, valuable and vulnerable areas and making management decision on that basis. You have taken it a little bit further maybe in, in uh, designating an MPAs. So this is, I think we have a lot in common in the discussion of what kind of regulations do you use in order to obtain a well-functioning ecosystem and the, the balance between 
environmental uh, regulations and uh, other effective area-based measures through the sector regulations. So it's very interesting. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Mr. Sheeb. Yes. So uh, once again, I thank you all, uh, uh, Mr. Sheeb, uh, Mr. Kitamura, and Mr. Mori. Uh, big round of applause to uh, three speakers at this keynote panel. Thank you very much uh, for your contributions. Now, um, I have a pleasure uh, to introduce the next uh, panel speakers, interactive panel. Uh, first speaker will be uh, Professor Elise Johansen, University of Tom's uh, and Specialist Council at uh, Wickborg uh, Rhine. Uh, may I invite now uh, Professor Elise Johansen uh, to take the floor. Thank you. Do you hear me? Yes, and if you can turn on your camera, if possible, and uh, should we um, operate your PowerPoint or you, will you do it by yourself? It is uh, good if you could uh, just uh, operate okay, my okay. PowerPoint. So we put up your uh, slide from our side, but yes, please go ahead. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for the invitation, and uh, good morning and good evening, everyone. So uh, I will, uh, my intervention, I will focus on, on um, two main points or, or one main point because I arrive at this uh, discussion or debate uh, from a legal viewpoint. Being a professor of law, I would look to uh, investigate or, or bring into the debate the role, uh, role of law. And, um, and the, the, the report from the Ocean Panel, which has been already uh, highlighted, it's, it's very promising in the way that it, um, it underlines that there is a lot of possibility um, when it comes to utilizing the ocean space for solutions and for future uh, resource utilization in a sustainable way. But it also presents challenges, uh, new challenges. Um, and and here, here is the crux that we are standing in. We are, when it comes to a, a, a from a legal viewpoint. So the legal framework that we are operating uh, within um, the expectation to is it, it's it's that it is to uh, represent some um, stability and predictability, which are essential um, characteristics of of a frame, legal framework. At the same time, we are living in a world that is more and more requiring us to be flexible and dynamic. Uh, so, so how do we approach this? And I would uh, give two examples, I think, of the of the challenges that we are facing. So, so yes, the, the, the report is very promising in that it represents possible solutions, but it also uh, then faces with some new challenges related to uh, more activities in this ocean space uh, that we uh, a, new, a new source of utilization of, of resources. Um, and and uh, and uh, that will raise more uh, spatial conflicts and interest conflicts. And and I thought I would use the Norwegian Ocean Management Plans and the Norwegian uh, regulatory approach as an example for my first point when it comes to the role of law uh, when it comes to ocean management is uh, that <laughs> the law does play a vital role. And and the, and the best result you get is when you harmonize or or you um uh, yeah you harmonize both the policy level with the legal level. So get back to the example of the Norwegian ocean management plans, as has been a very uh, good presented by Director Shiva. Uh, so we have a holistic and integrated uh, ocean management plan plans. You might recognize even the picture. Uh, on the right side, because it's uh, it's from the ocean management plans and also used by by Shiva in his presentation. Uh, so so those are in place, but those are policy plans. But the under underlying legal structure is still sector based, and that means when it comes to it, it we 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 see that there are has been some challenges, and we expect there be to be even more so when the uh, the competition for space space increases. Because when you are relying on an underlying sector-based approach for the for the legal approach, well, then you have the, the then it will be uh, the sec underlying sector who makes the decision, and they are obliged to often have the sector's interest in mind when when making these dec decisions. So we we see that there is a, a struggle there. There is some some um, some challenges there in order to really. Um, 
encompass or achieve the overarching goal of the management plans, which are a holistic and ecosystem-based approach. Uh, but that, that was my first point, the need to also ensure that within the legal level. Uh, and and I, I think that is a, a general um, challenge when it comes to uh, how to approach new, uh, new challenges uh, we are facing as a society, whether to, to lay yet another lay layer on the existing legal level you have, or to start uh, or look more holistically and start from a, from a different place all over. And, and to the second point, uh, I think that is uh, that, that leads me to the second point, whether, yes, there is a need to have an harmonized uh, legal level, harmonized with the political ambition level, if so to speak. But do we have the necessary legal tools? So if you look at ocean management, well, the, the underlying structure for everything is, is the law of the sea convention and which is based on a very sectoral and zonal approach. Uh, so whether we have need to also, uh, I, I wouldn't go as far to say it, to, to make something new, but to challenge our interpretation uh, and uh, our expectation of what we could do within that framework, uh, I think we need to look at. Um, but. Uh, the, the last point here in my intervention then is in related to do we have the necessary legal tools? I just would like to um, to do, to uh, take one example from the ongoing development within the EU then, because when we're talking about the necessary legal tools, when it comes from when we're talking from an environmental perspective, we and uh, so far uh, environmental law and climate law is based on uh, environmental principles and the understanding of environmental principles. Well, in the Law of the Sea Convention, there is an obligation for all member states to protect, protect and preserve the marine environment, but that has been embedded in the Law of the Sea Convention since, it's, uh, since it entered into force, and, and it hasn't really been enough. So we need to keep on developing, and we need to start and need to keep on challenging how we approach these issues and what kind of legal tools we utilize. And back to the EU example, what I find interesting here is that we see a development there that are really also um, uh, changing the behavior of the actors. And I'm talking about now uh, that the, the, the legal tools that they are developing, it, not within the field of environmental law, but within the, in the finance sector, where they are using um, the EU taxonomy, for one example, to start defining what a sustainable activity is. And basically, this is an instrument to attract private investment into more sustainable activities. But what the reaction that we see is that those actors, they want to um, achieve these standards of being sustainable within this system, because that makes them more attractive to the market, that makes it more attractive to the to those who are going to finance their activities. And these actors are those, for example, those new actors that will utilize ocean space in the future. And, and when we see that, that these sort of new tools can affect behavior, I find it interesting to also start exploring and just to keep in mind that we also need to uh, think outside of the box. We think we need to uh, also include new types of interest in instrument when we're talking about what holistic uh, ocean management is supposed to be. Thank you. That was my uh, intervention for, for the debate. Thank you very much, uh, Professor um, Johansen, um, for highlighting this uh, important uh, issue of uh, this, how we can really adjust this uh, sector-specific registrations to achieve uh, multiple yet interlinked uh, policy objectives and the businesses and the finance are also changing their behaviors uh, to pursue a higher sustainability. Uh, thank you uh, for highlighting that important point. Uh, next, uh, I have a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Peter Hogan, uh, Director of Norwegian Institute of Marine Research. Uh, he's uh, uh, one of the co-chairs uh, of the expert group for the high-level advisory panel for uh, sustainable ocean economy. Uh, Peter, please take a floor. Thank you very much, and I hope you can hear me, and maybe you can also show uh, my PowerPoint, please. Thank you. Um, so it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning or this afternoon. Uh, good day to everybody. 
Um, I thought it would be uh, perhaps uh, useful to start by uh, quoting from uh, the most recent uh, document from the high-level panel, this uh, guide to 100% sustainable ocean management, uh, the introduction. <clears throat> and uh, this is a document that was uh, launched in, in December 2021, so one year after the, the political transformations document from the, from the high-level panel, and uh, um, uh, containing uh, an interpretation of what we mean by sustainable ocean planning as a common ground between the high-level panel countries and between also involving those uh, institutions who are uh, willing to provide uh, technical and or financial support to countries in need of sustainable ocean planning. And while uh, this discussion today certainly has proven that both uh, Japan and Norway are quite advanced in moving towards uh, sustainable ocean planning, We've also heard mentioning of uh, uh, helping uh, in official development aid other countries. Uh, and I think it's quite useful that we have across the various members of the high level panel and even beyond as we expand this, uh, a common understanding of what we mean by sustainable ocean planning. So, so what you see on the screen are the, 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 the attributes that uh, this process of developing the guide has agreed upon that needs to be there in order to, to say that we have a sustainable ocean plan. The process needs to be inclusive, integrative, iterative, uh, so meaning we update the plans as has been exemplified also this morning. And inclusive means that uh, the number of stakeholders and the types of stakeholders may change in time. And then uh, place-based, ecosystem-based and knowledge-based, and that leads me to the, to the role of science and knowledge, which I will elaborate on a little bit uh, after this, uh, this overview. Um, and uh, uh, I think the ecosystem-based uh, approach was very clearly uh, highlighted by, by Per Schiever, looking at how the various industries and, and activities influence the ecosystem, which is in many ways at the center here. And then um, a good thing with the high-level panel is that it's uh, led by the prime ministers and presidents and, and the whole idea of not only doing you know, a nice plan based on science and based on experts, but having it endorsed. Uh, and for some countries, that is also quite important to ensure that it's financed and, and capacitated in order to, to do this. So this is what we're coming from, uh, from the high-level panel as, as the sort of the, the, the work marching order to, to go where we need to be in, in 2025 for the high-level panel countries and all other countries, hopefully by 2030. And if I may add, uh, we've heard today also about some of the instruments for the international waters, the biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. And I think we can only achieve a full sustainable ocean uh, if we also move into the international waters with this type of approach. And that's uh, sort of a, a, a goal in the future that I think we all need to keep in mind as we move into this area. So if I could have the next uh, slide, please. Um, um, what, um, what we also talk about in uh, this report um, for, um, for, from, the, from the high level panel uh, or to the high level panel um, is uh, other aspects of, uh, of uh, possibly useful components of a sustainable ocean plan. I'm, I'm still seeing the first slide. I don't know if you can move to the next one. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, uh, area-based plans, marine spatial planning, um, uh, but also some of the other aspects here, social and cultural considerations. This is moving into, you know, how is the policy set uh, and what is the economic development strategies? What are the various ways in which uh, we do environmental protection? And we've heard that uh, from several of you. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, then there are some challenges. I, I think now my PowerPoint disappeared, perhaps. Uh, I don't know if we can get it back or maybe I, I, should, I should close. Uh, I don't know. But uh, I think uh, um, what I would like to say uh, for me as a scientist, thank you, um, is that there are several challenges here in dealing with this aspect. We've heard about some of the legal challenges. And as a scientist, I've often said in this process with the high-level panel that the interaction between 
policy and action, and that means uh, also industries and, and sustainable industries and, 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 and uh, societal in, invol involvement, is, uh, is a big space. There's a big policy space. There's also a space for science and knowledge, uh, and we should uh, strive to share knowledge and make sure that it's available. But it's actually the policy space which is, is, is really the big one, and which should be the big one, even if we provide a lot of underpinning uh, science for this. So some of the challenges we are facing is to make sure that we have the right policy and institutional frameworks, that we continuously get the right stakeholders involved and they can respond to legal instruments, but they can also respond to consumer preferences. They can respond to, to societal expectations of how they are behaving. We need to have monitoring and evaluation, and that can be done by government regulation, but it can also be done by you know, voluntary uh, 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 certification and so on of ocean products, which we see some examples of. And then we, from the science side, need to involve also human dimension and social data when we deal with the difficult aspect of sustainability. Um, sustainability is difficult uh, not only to policy and, and legal aspects, but also to science. And, and this kind of linking everything together is, is very important there. So I hope that uh, that when we move forward, uh, we can, uh, and that's my final point, we can make sure that we use ocean accounts and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, evaluation of nature and natural capital as a key contributor, which hasn't really been used that much, I think, in, in planning up to now. We need to make sure that we don't only get the annual output from the ocean economy sectors, but that we actually invest so that the capital in the ocean is increasing and uh, tools to develop that i think are, are progressing rapidly with the developments last year also in the in the un system and uh, so we all have something to do to improve our, our ocean planning uh, even norway and even japan and i think by working together we can achieve uh, this in a better way so with that uh, thank you very much for this was my initial input to the discussion thank you Thank you, uh, Dr. Peter Hogan. Uh, he was uh, spearheading the, all the work of the high level panel, producing a series of blue papers. And uh, uh, definitely he enriched our knowledge and uh, uh, insight on this issue. Uh, thank you, Peter, for suggesting that uh, it's vital to invest uh, in the uh, enhancement of the ocean capital. Uh, that is a very important concept. Uh, now, I have a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Michitaku Makino of the uh, Atmosphere and Ocean Research Institute of the University of Tokyo, who will share with us his uh, experience in supporting marine spatial planning in Japan and maybe elsewhere. So, Professor Makino, uh, please take the floor. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, now I would like to share my PowerPoint. Okay, now I'm going to talk about uh, some experiences in the marine protected area and marine spatial planning in Shiretoko World Natural Heritage. Shiretoko World Natural Heritage is here, the northern part of Japan. Here uh, it's blessed with uh, many high biodiversity and a lot of fisheries resources. And also people have been living here for several thousand years. Okay, this map is showing the legal marine protected areas uh, set by the government of Japan. Uh, the red line is showing the fisheries resource conservation area and the shaded area is showing the sea bottom conservation areas and the green area is showing the natural park. In addition to these uh, official uh, government setting marine protected areas based on the legal framework. The local people, local fishermen are setting uh, a kind of autonomous uh, marine protected areas based on their local knowledge and traditional knowledge in order to protect the walleye polar spawning ground. Also, science is very important. Uh, the World Natural Heritage Scientific Council uh, I'm a member of this council. It's uh, regularly uh, monitoring and assessing their management activities. Therefore, the collaboration among the government, 
and local stakeholders and science. This collaboration is the key of the sustainable uh, sustainability of the world natural heritage. That is my uh, information. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Makino. Uh, this uh, um, Shiretoko case, uh, UNESCO uh, World Natural Heritage, was, was one of the key achievements by Japan uh, to uh, uh, actually plan and implement this marine spatial uh, planning. Uh, we will get back to you about uh, further questions. Um, I have now pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Uh, Iku Sato, Senior General Manager of the Renewable Energy Division, Toda Corporation, that is an important uh, business sector company enterprise now uh, to promote uh, offshore renewable energy in Japan. Uh, may I invite uh, uh, Mr. Sato to take a floor? Thank you very much. Good morning and good evening. I am Sato of the Ocean Renewable Energy Division. I'd like to now share with you my PowerPoint. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, we can see it. In Japan, we have a wind power potential, which is shown here, as you see, in Japan, total potential amounts to more than 9,000 terawatt hours, terawatt hour, and when this is compared to total consumption power in Japan, it is tenfold of what is actually consumed here in Japan. And in terms of primary energy, the, we have about 5,000 terawatt hour worth of energy that is used and uh, the, the wind power potential is uh, nearly twice as much as that. So given that huge potential, as we aim for decarbonization, using this much terawatt hour, uh, the, the, the potential that is indicated in terawatt hour, we'd like to achieve decarbonization by 2050. Japan has a vast area of EEZs. By taking advantage of that vast area, that could be quite useful. And we heard earlier about the need for investing into the capital. Out of 9,000 terawatt hour, suppose that we use about 3,000 terawatt hour. That's worth of Three hundred forty-two trillion yen investment that will be required. We consider the durable life of the wind power facilities. That's about twenty-five years, and therefore, when we divide three hundred twenty-four trillion by twenty-five, that means every year we need to spend about thirteen trillion yen as capex. At the same time, we are importing oil and LNG. And that comes to about 12 trillion yen in terms of the value we pay for import. So we need to spend about the same amount as a capex. And with that, we can achieve decarbonization. And at Toda Corporation, We have been interested in taking advantage of such a facility, and we started uh, the investigation 
since 2007. And we believe we are the ones uh, that stand between the scientists and uh, the uh, actual operators, and we are engineers and we're preparing for the future. And we successfully started commercial operation 2016 and 2021 when there was the first auction for the floating offshore wind facility was called for toda successfully won that auction and a major theme here is about uh, symbiosis with the uh, local community. And here is a QR code. That is because uh, our initiatives were uh, taken up at NHK World Japan program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sato, for uh, sharing uh, uh, your business operations. Um, this uh, floating window turbine is uh, one of the innovation uh, that uh, needed for expanding this uh, offshore wind turbines in addition to the fixed bottom wind turbines. And uh, we are very much look for, look, looking forward to learning more about uh, how you have managed to uh, build a consensus uh, with the local communities for the installation of the offshore wind turbines. Uh, now I have a pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Tomohiko Tsunoda, my colleague, uh, Senior Research Fellow of the OPRI SPF, uh, who will also share with us his, the highlight of uh, his research on this marine spatial planning. Um, Mr. Tsunoda, please uh, take a floor. Hi, Tsunoda. I'm Tomohiko Tsunoda of OPRI. Uh, first, I'd like to express appreciation for giving me this opportunity to talk about the progress of integrated, integrated ocean management in Japan. First, I'd like to introduce the international trend of ocean policy and Japan's basic act on ocean policy. International policy on the ocean has long been oriented towards sustainable development as seen at the as summit, OPRI's major contribution to the enactment of Japan's basic act on ocean policy in 2007 helped bring about the country's alignment with the worldwide trend towards sustainable use. In the basic act, the importance of harmonization of the development and conservation of ocean is emphasized in Article 2. To explain Japanese law system very briefly, it consists of basic act and the uh, individual law. Basic acts set basic policy and individual laws stipulate <coughs> specific matters and government has implemented measures in individual ocean sectors such as fisheries and shipping. The basic act on ocean, on the other hand, is responsible mainly for the coordination of individual sectors. The need for individual law based on the basic act was recognized in order to specifically promote coordination across the sectors. Therefore, OPRI issued the proposal for the individual law on integrated ocean management. And in 2014, the law went through the specific legislative process within the ruling party, but unfortunately, it was not submitted in the diet. At the time, one of the challenge was that there was not a high level of concrete needs for the use and conservation of ocean beyond the existing framework. For example, only 0.2 gigawatt of offshore, wi offshore wind power has been installed in Japan. In contrast, in recent years, the need for integrated ocean management has emerged from both the development and the conservation of the ocean. First, I'd like to, like to introduce the perspective, perspective of development of the ocean area. Japan is expected to significantly expand offshore wind power thanks to former Prime Minister Suga's strong promotion of carbon neutral policies. 
in relation to this, there were amendments to the Port and Harbor Act in 2016 and the enactment of the law to promote the use of my area for renewable energy. Legally, uh, the government supports the expansion of offshore wind power. This upper map is the area of installation of offshore wind power at the port of Kitakyushu, following the revision of port and harbor law. And this is, uh, it is now expanding from the port area to terrestrial waters outside the port, including the Nagasaki area. And the process of adjusting the installation area for offshore wind power, including the public selection process of the developers is almost the same as the marine spatial planning. Next, I'd like to talk about the marine conservation. As you know, in response to the IH target, countries are required to set 10% of marine protect area by 2020. In contrast, for a long time, Japan has only been able to set 8.3%. In response, the Japanese government amended the Nature Conservation Act to allow marine protected area to be established in the offshore seabed area and the MPA has been expanded. Regarding the next CBD targets, there is high possibility that MPA will be 30% by 2030 and we need to further expand MPA in Japanese waters. These two examples, offshore wind farm and MPA, indicate new need for development and conservation of the ocean in Japan. In other words, integrated management will become a necessity for Japan in the near future. In December 2020, the high-level panel committed leaders the preparation to 100% sustainable management of national water by 2025. And Japan's participation in this commitment is very much in line with this trend. I believe that marine spatial planning will become more important as a tool for integrated ocean management. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tsunoda-san, for sharing your uh, insight on this uh, uh, marine spatial planning particularly in the context of expanding offshore renewable energy and the marine protected areas. Uh, now, after listening to the uh, five speakers, I'd like to come back to the speakers for further questions and uh, uh, soliciting some feedback. I also received uh, some feedback from the audience. Uh, now, the, I just wanted to get back to Professor Johansen and uh, Dr. Peter Hogan. Uh, that uh, both mentioned this finance and the investment. And I think marine special planning uh, that has to really catalyze this increased uh, blue finance uh, for achieving a higher sustainability in the ocean management. And uh, Professor Johans mentioned this uh, gap between legislation, finance, and uh, business behaviors. Uh, can I ask uh, both of you, uh, to elaborate a bit more about how you can really overcome this gap that still exists uh, in between legislation, businesses, and the finance, and uh, how the Norway, um, for instance, uh, uh, try to catalyze further investment in the uh, ocean sustainability or so-called uh, blue economy through uh, blue finance. May I first ask uh, Professor Johansen uh, to react on this issue? Uh, thank you. Um, I can. Uh, I mean, you can think of of uh, the, it's public investments or it's private investments, and uh, and I can uh, just elaborate a bit on on uh, how the EU and then eventually Norway as well through the EEA agreement uh, will approach this. So. Um, <clears throat> So, so they have put in place a, a program consisting of both a strategy and, and legal tools in order to achieve that aim to really steer private investment towards uh, sustainable activities. And, and, uh, and the basic question is, what do you need in order to, to get more private investments? Well, you need to, to ensure 
that that what they're really investing is is really green. So they are implementing tools to to uh, avoid greenwashing, to make uh, investments uh, more um, safe uh, in in the in that respect. That they know what they are investing in, that they, that they can rely on the information that they are uh, receiving for, from the in, um, investee. So there are two basic tools that they have uh, employed. And one is the EU taxonomy, which categorize the different types of activities. By going from a broad sustainable principle, which is a principle, to giving it specific criteria, what does it mean to be sustainable within this activity? And in addition, and it works alongside because the EU taxonomy is not an obligation to become sustainable. It only obliged uh, um, the relevant or those that are, um, um, for those that the, the legal tool is applicable to report on whether they are aligned or not. So the other mechanism is report new reporting and disclosure obligations. So you need to be much more transparent with what you're doing or with what you're not doing. And these two instruments together are put in place in order to steer and make it safer, make it uh, avoid the fear of greenwashing and, and really steer investments towards sustainable activities. Thank you, Professor Johansen. Um, can I ask uh, Peter to react on this issue as well? Yes, th thank you very much. This is an interesting topic. I, I think also when just as a starter, this uh, taxonomy and so on also depends on you know, a criteria set and, and knowledge. So for example, how much CO2 emissions shall you allow in order to come in a certain category for finance? That's also an interesting sort of science and knowledge issue. But I thought I would mention uh, uh, a public procurement as a way, an instrument to, to speed up, uh, you know, transition to, uh, to sustainable economy. And I think in Norway, a particular example that comes to mind is the uh, electric ferries and now beginning also hydrogen ferries that we are seeing being implemented a lot in in in, in norwegian waters and that has been the case that the, the these are are you know in the in the in the county or in the, in the league in the districts it's not a, a central norwegian thing it's it's run by the by the counties uh, and they have put up criteria for for and then competition to make sure that we have uh, uh, low or actually zero CO2 emission on some of these uh, ferries. So that has, I think, speeded up the development of the industry in that particular area, and which is now seen as moving into larger ships, moving into cruise ships, and, and moving into ammonia and these more complicated things. So public procurement, when you can use it, is quite uh, quite a powerful example from Norway that, that I'd like to, to mention. Uh, it's, there are, I'm, I'm sure there are limitations, but this ha has worked in this particular case. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, for both uh, Professor Johansson and Peter. Um, for the Norway, um, this sovereign fund uh, has been really playing an important role in raising sustainability and EU taxonomy, sustainability criteria, public procurement, uh, all important drivers uh, for enhancing sustainability. Thank you indeed for your insight. Uh, may I now just uh, return to the Japanese speakers? And I think the key issue was about how we can really achieve a consensus among different stakeholders. And then maybe I ask uh, Professor Makino, uh, Mr. Sato, and maybe Mr. Tsunoda as to what are the really uh, important features to achieve a consensus among different stakeholders. Uh, for the case of uh, uh, Shiretoko, I am sure that there was a stiff competition between conservationists and fishermen. What was a success factor for them to come to an agreement? May I ask first, uh, Professor Makino, uh, yes. to shed the light on this? Yes, thank you, Kobayashi-san. Uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning of my talk, people have been living in that area for at least 7,000 years. So people is an integral, more one of the most important part of the local ecosystem. That is the very beginning of our discussion. So the balance between the local people's use and ecosystem conservation, that is the objective of our uh, world natural heritage. So that kind of, uh, you know, uh, the discussion is, I think, the key of uh, the consensus. 
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Makino. Yeah, people-centered uh, plan and implementation is really a key. And may I now ask uh, uh, Mr. Sato um, for the offshore renewable energy development. The local communities are also asking for the economic returns from the development of this offshore renewable energy. Uh, what are your experience so far in terms of sharing a benefit so of offshore energies with the local communities? Hi. Thank you very much. Yes. The offshore wind uh, power generation there was some concern that, that uh, such a development offshore wind farm would uh, have a detrimental effect on fisheries. So that was, uh, however, a misunderstanding. So our first step was to wipe out that misunderstanding. And then after that misunderstanding has been wiped off, then we need to explain the benefit or potential benefit to local economy. Of course, uh, the primary beneficiary would be the developer, but at the same time, the clear benefits should be presented to local fish as well. And that way, yes, uh, that, would be, would, that went a long way for uh, business, not only financial or economic benefits to local fishers, but uh, blue and clean uh, fisheries are uh, now expected and then that means that a large-scale investment in fishery activities is necessary so for richer and the sustainable fisheries fishing activities we would not directly but indirectly we developers would uh, help uh, would uh, make uh, would contribute to the local economy. That means that uh, we uh, do uh, make uh, the financial contributions to local uh, governments. And then uh, the energy we produce uh, wouldn't pollute the sea and uh, all these facilities uh, would be uh, the removed cleanly when uh, our operations are completed. So, and by showing that way clearly, then we'd be able to obtain the uh, consent from the fisheries. With the local sustainable fishery is a very uh, important foundation and uh, uh, your financial contribution to the local government uh, is obviously uh, one of the key incentives for the local communities to accommodate uh, offshore wind energies uh, within this uh, sustainable fishery framework. Um, thank you for sharing that uh, perspectives. So may I now uh, ask uh, Tsunoda-san uh, how, how uh, we can really achieve this consensus uh, among different stakeholders. People may have a different interest in terms of the ocean space use or uh, uh, building these marine protected areas, or maybe uh, some people are not in favor of having a marine protected areas. Uh, do you have any ideas as to how we can really overcome such a difference and uh, achieve uh, agreement and the consensus? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, the previous speaker talked about the uh, offshore wind farm and the, each turbine is growing larger and larger. That, that means that uh, the uh, distance between uh, the two uh, turbines are the, uh, becoming larger. Uh, the 4.4 gigawatts, uh, 10 uh, kil uh, square kilometer space is necessary. That is uh, that larger than the inside area of the Yamanote line in Tokyo. And so uh, with the requirement for such as sea, a large sea space, what we sh can do and we should do? The first step is to know what uh, activities are now going on in the uh, target uh, uh, sea ocean uh, area. For example, the, the uh, Umisil platform is, has been uh, the launched and operated by uh, Japan Coast Guard. 
uh, to share the knowledge uh, oceanographic and uh, other uh, uh, data uh, are now shared. And for MPA, example, uh, floating uh, the wind uh, the power turbines, uh, Yes, uh, the, that will increase, uh, as uh, Mr. Sato said, and uh, we go further into the ocean uh, for wind power generation. And so what does then uh, should be protected and how? And uh, that way we would be able to secure the certain platform or the sea. And uh, the last year, the uh, UN uh, Decade, uh, the for uh, the uh, for uh, ocean uh, the science started, and uh, we will uh, continue activities in line with that decade. I thank you very much. Important to promote a mutual understanding of the project and sharing the benefit from that project uh, that uh, varied for offshore renewable energy development and marine protected areas. And definitely this has to be addressed in the context of the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development. Um, yeah, I just wanted to get back to uh, Peter about how we can really uh, replicate uh, this kind of ideas to other key ocean states through the high level panel. And uh, Peter was very much uh, instrumental uh, in promoting such a knowledge through the expert group and advisory network of the high level panel. Uh, many countries around the world haven't yet adopted this uh, sustainable ocean plan and, uh, and they really need this uh, probably the uh, ocean uh, marine spatial planning. Um, do you have any uh, perspective as to how maybe both uh, Japanese and Norwegian colleagues can collaborate in supporting some other countries and stakeholders uh, to pursue this uh, sustainable ocean plan and marine spatial planning. Uh, may I ask Peter to um, respond uh, to this? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Masanori. And that's a, a question that I really like. I think, first of all, we should note that with uh, President Biden and, and the US then recently joining the high level panel and also now uh, President Macron of France. Of course, we have a very wide coverage already with the members of the, of the panel. Now, uh, but it cannot be expanded to every nation. And we have to think of ways to work with uh, other countries which are not uh, members are not going to be members. and. Uh, I think uh, there are a couple of approaches. Uh, one is the regional approach. If uh, countries work with their neighbors, often uh, sh uh, management of the ocean is very much dependent on what happens in neighboring countries because of uh, influences from pollution and various economic activities. Uh, and then, uh, uh, so creating a kind of a regional networks, so I think is, is one way to go. And then I think uh, in terms of uh, developing countries and, and, you know, the large number of countries we have, um, uh, we have to work with some kind of partnership beyond the panel. Um, we could share knowledge and experience through the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development that you mentioned. I think we should not be shy of using that as a mechanism also for sustainable ocean planning and, and associated knowledge buildup, but also sharing of experience and as a framework for capacity building in developing countries, which we can work together under that uh, umbrella. Um, so, uh, so I think uh, having the ocean panel countries as taking the lead and being those in the forefront of developing this agenda, and then wider partnerships uh, regionally and globally uh, is the way to go. And it's uh, uh, policy level, uh, action level, and, and science level, and the latter is is uh, is well placed within the UN Decade of Ocean Science. I think. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Peter, for uh, mentioning this regional approach, capacity building, and science. Uh, definitely, uh, we hope to further collaborate with you uh, to achieve sustainable ocean, not just uh, in two countries but also around the world as well. 
Um, we are running out of time a bit, but maybe it's good to have a, a few words from the other speakers. May I ask uh, Professor Elis Johansen to say anything uh, uh, before we conclude this session? Yes, uh, thank you. It's a, it's a very, it's been a very interesting debate, and to to focus on on going forward and and how we can share and uh, our achieved um, experience and also continue developing and uh, continuing that dialogue in every uh, in every possible platforms, both both from a scientific platform, as been mentioned, and and use also the the global platforms uh, that are available that's uh, that's essential for for moving forward okay thank you professor johansen uh, professor makino yes uh, i have learned a lot from the norwegian experiences and also i found that we have many things in common so uh, we would like to uh, work together for the deeper collaboration thank you very much Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sato, please. Hi. Uh, yes. Thank you. No way. Is an advanced nation in terms of maritime activities and maritime development, and there are a lot that we can learn from them. And in terms of global expansion, as is represented by automobile industry, Japan is good at uh, producing the, the high quality cars with lower prices. And therefore we hope that we can combine the both countries' advantages and strength uh, to pursue our goals. Yes. Ocean Panel advocates a sustainable management of uh, the ocean by 2025 and Japan is part of that that is quite important and therefore on top of that I would say that through collaboration with Norway and other countries Japan can play a leading role in Asia Pacific role, uh, region for instance and that's uh, the one of the points that I learned today five speakers for this interactive panel uh let's give a, a big round of applause to the five speakers thank you very much uh, for your uh, contributions um now i have a pleasure to recognize and invite uh, ambassador inga nihama of uh, norway to japan uh to take a floor to uh, deliver concluding remarks but just to say that uh, ambassador nihama and his colleagues uh, very much instrumental in encouraging us to convene this and uh, i hope that uh, you found today's late discussions very constructive and useful uh, may i invite ambassador nihama to take a floor to give us the concluding remarks dear everyone indeed i did my name is inga nihama and i'm norway's ambassador to japan the Norwegian Embassy in Tokyo and the Ocean Policy Research Institute of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation are partners in hosting today's and tomorrow's Japan-Norway Sustainable Ocean Policy Forum. Today's uh, interventions have been enlightening and inspiring in equal measure, and it falls on me to carry out the small but very important task of thanking all our speakers, panelists and moderators for their contributions to the first day of this forum. Well done. I would also like to express our gratitude to all our listeners. We know that you have all taken valuable time out of your busy schedules to log on and follow the discussions. For me, the exchanges we have heard here today have really been food for thought. For Norway, ocean sustainability is not a matter of rhetoric. Fisheries, Aquaculture and ocean-related tourism all depend on healthy, thriving oceans. They are fundamentally important to our economic uh, prosperity. And uh, there is more. A large offshore petroleum sector and a world-class shipping and maritime industry are pillars of Norway's economy. Energy-intensive heavy industry building on hydroelectric power is dotting our long shoreline, 
in the company of rapidly expanding offshore wind projects. We must ensure the long-term productive uh, coexistence of all of these crucial parts of our economy. Sustainable ocean management is a vital political priority for us. As you have heard, however, the goal of ocean sustainability cannot be achieved by domestic policy means alone. There is only one ocean spanning the entire globe. What happens in one place will eventually affect everyone. Joint efforts for sustainable ocean management are crucial. On this background, the Norwegian government set up the High Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy that we have talked a lot about today, it's the Ocean Panel. Together with co-chair Palau and the heads of government of Japan, Australia, Indonesia, Fiji, the US, Canada, and many others, we have chiseled out an ambitious new action agenda with sustainable ocean management at its core. If implemented, these actions can go a long way towards achieving the goal of conserving and sustainably using the oceans, seas and marine resources for sustainable development, as SDG 14 tells us to do. If you're not already familiar with it, please go to oceanpanel.org and read up on the transformations. It's really worth it. Tomorrow, we will have day two of our Ocean Policy Forum, concentrating on a particularly vital part of the sustainable ocean agenda, namely fisheries. I hope many of you will log on tomorrow as well, and I promise you we will have a range of interesting speakers and panelists lined up. Again, a big thank you to today's speakers and panelists and to our wonderful audience. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ambassador Nihama, for very encouraging uh, concluding remarks. Uh, we will indeed collaborate on ocean issues and for the Sustainable Ocean Panel. Uh, thank you for your encouragement. Uh, then uh, we will see tomorrow. Uh, I understand that the Japanese and the Norwegian ski jumpers are competing tonight in Beijing. I hope uh, they will make a big jump tonight and uh, we will also make a big jump on for sustainable ocean once again thank you very much for joining us and we will see you tomorrow at the same time uh, for discussing sustainable fisheries uh, see you tomorrow thank you very much <clears throat>